It's great to be as here a large crowd, large digital available crowd. Um, it's it's a, a great opportunity to speak to you uh, as civil servants involved in data yourselves. Um, and as a journalist, I have been involved in data for many, working with data for many years now. Um, I am originally a historian. I, I studied uh, history at the University of Basel, focusing on um, the 19th century and the industrialization of Europe. Um, and as a journalist, my focus, I've been a journalist for over 20 years now, my focus shifted to technology and how technology um, is um, changing our society, our lives. I reported very early on on, uh, um, on the what was happening in Silicon Valley at a time when you could still get Mark Zuckerberg's phone number. But in the course of my work, I, um, I, I, I learned to code. Um, and I started to use the technologies that I was writing about. I started to use them more and more um, as a tool for reporting. Um, and I, in 2008, I co-founded the OpenData.ch um, association, Swiss association nonprofit um, that is involved in basically lobbying um, on the uh, federal and the canton level um, and municipal level, if you want, uh, for, for 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 the for administrations to 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 publish their data, open data by default. Um, currently, I see that there is uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, discussions going on uh, in various administrations all over Europe. Um, currently, in Switzerland, we have reached a point. Where, there, where we are very close to the Switzerland introducing a law, um, not just a regulation, but a law um, that all administrations in the country um, need to publish their data um, openly by default. Um, meaning, um, we will be talking about this um, during the course of this, these uh, 45 minutes, meaning, the data needs to be free, uh, freely available. It needs to be really usable, and it, very importantly, it needs to be machine readable. Um, and we will be going into a little bit more detail on this later on. Now, it's just just another look back when we start when we founded this uh, association, OpenData.ch. There are other um, very similar. Um, organizations all over Europe and Germany, very active in the Scandinavian countries, obviously very active, um, Austria, uh, UK. Um, when we started this in 2008, uh, it was very interesting what it, it, because it was dri basically driven by, driven by small um, app developing com uh, companies. When, uh, when Apple released its uh, iPhone, um, it uh, um, there was this surge in people wanting to build apps and something what happened in Switzerland was a lot of people wanted to build uh, apps on uh, timetables because that was something that didn't exist then. And um, basically the surge to open up the data trove of the Swiss railroad railroad uh, company, uh, um, the SBB, um, was that what people did, uh, civil hackers if you want, they scraped um, the uh, the the uh, national trade services websites for data on timetables and, and delays, and then created their own uh, data set, which they then made apps with. Um, and this that has now actually led to this led, then led to the SBB open creating their own open data portal, which is used by dozens of companies now uh, to just for various different products, and uh, not just timetables anymore. Various different products. Um, and it has also led fundamentally to this to this law that Switzerland is in the process of uh, uh, introducing. It still has to be voted on in Parliament. Um, but currently, um, I head the the uh, uh, as Maria mentioned. Um, I am no longer really. I would not describe myself as a data activist. I uh, I'm, my focus is really as a journalist working with the data. Um, and I head the visuals department at the Swiss Daily NZZ, Neue Zeitung. Um, we have our team 
um, consists of three sub teams. We have develop software developers, we have data journalists, and we have information and graphic designers. And um, we have in the past, over the past year, um, or over the past one and a half years, really experienced a surge in interest in what we do, um, in what data journalists, graphic designers, information designers, and software developers, um, what they what we do. Um, there are several, I think there were key, three key reasons for this. Um, this, uh, the, the suddenly very readily available um, detailed data on um, uh, co uh, corona infections um, that, has, that is updated sometimes hourly from in, in all over the world. We have combined with the fact that the internet is fundamentally a very visual medium. We have, uh, it can be used in so many different ways, obviously, so can the internet. But um, very often, the way people consume information and news um, on their mobile devices um, is is in a very visual way because that's what you can you can cram a lot of content a lot of uh, and be very precise. Um, for instance, with graphs on your mobile screen. Um, so these these uh, the, the internet being visual, the, the size of the mobile screens, and this. Um, this very um, this 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 need for information on the coronavirus and COVID nineteen has has and, and the availability of the data has uh, really um, have boosted data driven visual journalism um, over the past one and a half years. This is the kind of content. This is what we um, as a team um, at the NZZ uh, work on. Um, these are three examples, uh, sorry, five examples of stories, uh, the type of stories that, that, we, that, that we work on. They're all um, basically, fundamentally data-driven. This story over here um, was a story um, on the, the main concerns slash myths regarding vaccinations that, that, uh, that our readers or readership in general have. Um, and the way we researched this was uh, we looked at how, what people were Googling, what, people, what are the questions that people are Googling um, in Switzerland and Germany. Uh, we are a German uh, publication, so that was our, that, that's our main readership. So what we did, we, we looked at the data, um, what people were most interested using uh, Google's data and developed then a short piece um, going through each of these myths um, and then which has obviously led to a very, very high uh, uh, ranking within the search engines of this piece because it addresses all the main questions that people are having. Um, that was more um, a kind of basic research that we did. This, this, uh, this, this story here, um, focusing on the electoral system in uh, the US, um, also uh, um, data driven, obviously, but we, what we're using here is a, a different technique, a way of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, using short, brief animation elements um, and, the, and the, the, the very common way of scrolling through content on the mobile phone to, to break down the, the complexity of the, uh, the, the voting system in the States and also highlighting um, what we um, decided were the crucial swing states um, to draw people in to where the story is happening in the States. This was obviously uh, uh, released um, in October, maybe it was in September, uh, during the, uh, the actual campaign for the American residents. Back to COVID, um, what we did here, again, um, piece that was fundamentally data driven what we did was we broke down the numbers in switzerland uh, of corona infections covid deaths and so on people that were had lost their job um, in this in these difficult times um, broke it down and imagined what how what would the percentage of people be if the whole of switzerland were 100 people living in one living in one house one household um, so uh, and, and told this again using this, uh, this, uh, this very neat 
and, and immersive uh, storytelling technique. Very, very visual story. Um, this was a very uh, a, a story that needed a lot of uh, data research on our side. Impossible to have one common source for a story like this. This story here um, was what I mentioned at the beginning, um, a, 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 a collection of all the relevant um, uh, data on the development of the pandemic. Um, trying to, you, I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen these uh, similar reports in local or national newspapers, wherever you're living, um, covering um, the state of the, of the pandemic and where the where one's region or, or country stands. Um, what we what we have here is a, a very uh, simplified um, um, uh, production of, of what of what of, of all the Swiss cantons. Um, showing um, the rate of the amount of people that have been uh, uh, vaccinated in these cantons. So you see, the darker ones would have been uh, have, have, have higher rates, and the less, and the, and the grey ones have lower rates. Um, and this, a lot of the, this story um, is all. Um, we'll be talking. Oh, well, I'll be talking a little bit more about this story and how we developed it in more detail. This, these are very few sort data sources that we use here, and this is a story that we can update daily by simply pressing a button. Um, we checking the information, checking if the, if the code that we have developed to work with the data is correct, but fundamentally, we just, we're just pressing a button to update this. And the final type of stories that we do at the Entertet at Visuals is a, 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 a inter interactive stories, giving um, users, our readers, the possibility to interact with the larger data sets in a very simple way. What we're doing here is giving them the, the possibility to compare the rate or the, uh, the rate of vaccination uh, uh, campaigns in countries all over the world. Again, we're using a, 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 um, a, a data source from a third party. Um, in this case, it's Our World in Data, an organization in, in the UK. That connect that have really um, put a lot of resources into collecting uh, data on the pandemic from all over the world, and it have, has become a very reliable source. So that's the kind of content that we do. Um, so yeah, this is this is a less uh, uh, visually driven, but the fundamental bits of data research for, um, at, at the beginning. Right over here, it's a very, very visually driven stories that work so well on mobile screens. Now, we're going to be talking about five, I want to give five uh, detailed descriptions of the stories. We want to, I want, and I want to highlight uh, the new and developing skill sets of journalists. Now, um, um, Maria has, has asked me several points, you know, why, why is this relevant to us? We're not journalists. Why do we need to know about uh, new and developing skill sets of journalists. Well, and I would like we I would like to talk about this a little bit more in detail. Um, well, yes, I think um, you were civil servants. Um, I think um, it is a it's good idea to know what the skills of the people are that you're addressing with what you're offering. Um, and in this case, it's data. We'll go into a little bit more of that in detail and. That's basically the third point where we will try to bring everything together. What these new and developing need, what the new and developing needs of journalists do to the governmental administrations and, and how you can meet them. I would like to propose a few suggestions. But let's talk about five the five stories that I mentioned. Now the first story is um, a story I did a while ago. Um, at this point I was working for the Zurich uh, Tagesanzeiger, another Swiss daily. Um, and uh, this will, what I want to do here is highlight um, the, how, regardless how you publish your text or data, if there's a story there and the journalists have a good, um, have an idea, they will structure this data um, sooner or later. Now, about five years ago, in a meeting with the, uh, the investigative team, uh, a colleague, Simon Rao was her name, she approached me and said, look, I have heard um, from several um, 
uh, lawyers claiming that depending on the party of the sorry uh, that was, so i'm having some interference maybe there's a microphone on i will just carry on um now at some um this colleague approached me and said uh, she has she has uh, several lawyers who have approached her saying that depending on the the uh, the uh, party background of, of the of a federal swiss judge um they have better or really really bad chances of succeeding with the uh, plaintiffs the plaintiffs um, accounts at, in court um, especially when it came to migrants now um it, it, for you as just just a little bit of context um the swiss court system um any case can actually be brought to the top level to the supreme court you have the supreme court in lausanne and in zandale which is in the city in the east of the country you have the swiss administrative supreme court who deal with everything any complaint regarding the administration now these what, what we, what we focused on here were the complaints from migrants um and the uh situation that in Swiss, Swiss law, Swiss judges on this level all are uh, always backed by a party. So you have right uh, um, uh, judges backed by right wing uh, parties, by centrist parties, and or by left wing parties. The Green, uh, the Green Party, for instance, has a judge, uh, has several judges in the, in the court. Now, what uh, the question was is. Um, if we if we have if we know uh, if we have all this information, we can actually then look into into uh, 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 whether this claim of these lawyers is true. Do right wing judges treat migrants worse than left one, left wing ones? Um, of course, uh, it seems obvious, but it's something that we could, can actually prove because every um, uh, decision the court makes is then published uh, uh, on the by law, has to be met, has to be published. The only thing that's anonymized is the, the plaintiff's names, but everything else is published. Um, on the, and, we, and I thought, okay, if that's all available, maybe they have this data available in a structured manner. So I uh, contact this the, the Swiss Ministry of Supreme Court with that request, and they said, oh no, we're not going to give you the, the, the data in a structured way. Um, we might have it, um, but we're not going to do that. Um, that is a data that we, will, we, we, we look after. We do, we, don't, we do not want to share that with the public. What we do share uh, sim, uh, the singular, uh, the separate, uh, our decisions. Um, you can see these, this is an example of a judge. Every judge has a, has a right at the end. This was the Social Democratic Party of Switzerland, every judge. So I, that's totally transparent. Um, and this is the database um, where at the time, there were much more uh, in there now, but there were thirty thousand asylum appeals um, in in the in the database. So what we did, um, because the judge, the, the court did, did did not want to give us that, we we will develop a, a script that visited every single one of these appeals, thirty thousand of them, and saved them on saved them off onto our our computer. Um, this is what this is an example of what, what, what of these uh, texts look like. You have um, uh, structured every single one, one of them in a very very similar way. You have a date. Um, you have these are the anonymized parties here. Uh, you have you even have um, uh, details on where this person was from or the people that were from, and you have details on the lawyers. But most importantly, what we were looking for was the name of the law, the judges that were involved. And whether this judge um, in Switzerland, everything will be published in German, in French, and Italian. This was the, the beginning. I have chosen a, an example from a, a German um, appeal, and I have here yeah, is uh, the, the the result of this of what the judges decided because this one was rejected in French. So what we can do, we're going to scrape. What we did was we, we scraped um, off the website. If you're not, if you're not. Um, if the term scraping is not one that is common to you, basically it means um, 
finding on a website, on a, on a HTML, HTML based website, and finding the information, the relevant information, and saving that off in a structured file, for instance, as an Excel file onto your, onto your computer, onto your local device. Um, we wanted to um, uh, scrape the, 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 the database and we want to analyze the programs. Now, what we, um, what we, the, 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 what we did, um, this was a brief example. I won't go into any, any real detail here. Um, um, this, I don't want to get too uh, technical, but the point is here, all the tools that we use were totally open source. Anybody with the, with the, with the, with, I would say minor programming skills can do this, can implement this. And what we did, we shared the whole process on a software platform called GitHub. Um, GitHub has become, um, there's another an, another uh, 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 author called GitLab. There are several of these, but GitHub has become the, one of the new main spaces for people to share um, the, 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 the codes like this. Journalists share a lot of information here uh, to, to share not just the results, but the process they developed in, in their, uh, to, to share their findings. Um, everything here was, is open source. Here is an example um, of, I, as I said, I don't want to get too technical here, but you can see um, this is what this, this is the scraping process. We're impersonating a browser and clicking in within this database. And this is for us, for us humans, uh, right, uh, you, you will get the idea. We're basically, basically clicking on certain um, elements within this HTML page to pull down the information and analyze it. Um, and in a second, in a second run through, once we have that information, we can then go in and look to see whether a, um, uh, whether a verdict was, um, accepted or denied by the judges. Now, so we did this for these 30,000 of them. And this was the result. This was just a brief, very brief, uh, visualization of, of, uh, of the amounts of cases that these, these judges had to deal with every month. So you see around about 250 and every month we, and overall we work, we then worked out to see um, how much of these claims were denied or accepted. What were the parties of, um, uh, of, of these various, of these various judges. So this was just, this was the, these were the judges with the, the, the most lenient ones. They had about 30% of them that they accepted. You can see the green, um, there was a social democratic party, and on the other scale of the of of the um, we had ones with very very low rates, um, so a large diff large discrepancy between um, um, uh, the, 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 these judges' rulings. Now, um, this might not be that um, fantastic if you uh, uh, if you if they, if certain judges would be dealing with certain plaintiffs from different specific countries, but that wasn't the case. There was a computer that randomly assigned these people with, uh, with these judges with cases. So there is no reason for these quotas to be so different. Now we ran, um, a row of stories on this, um, and, uh, on, on, on this discrepancy. Um, you can see this is, this is how we represented it. Um, the judges with the, 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 the lowest quotas and the ones with the highest, um, accompanying the story obviously spoke to the, spoke to a lot of people that were involved in these rulings, not just the judges, but also the lawyers. Um, and, uh, we could also, um, pick different angles in these stories. We could also show which were the most successful lawyers. We could also show quite, quite relevant to, 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 uh, to the Swiss, uh, um, system as well, which lawyers were the ones who weren't really representing their clients at all for getting paid for it. Um, so we could really, with this, with this simple question, with this simple uh, code, we could really um, have a totally different look on the structured data that the court originally didn't want to supply. We could give a very novel view on the uh, Swiss legal system um, in, this, in this case.
the argument uh, of obviously the the, uh, the the court denied that um, there was such a thing as as this uh, uh, as the as the political party of these judges actually playing a role in, in their decisions. But very interestingly, today, um, the judges that are the most harshest on both ends, the ones, the ones that are the most lenient, they have been changed, moved to different departments, which I find, um, uh, and, and, if you, and we, I recently re-ran this. Um, they still don't publish the data structured, uh, structuredly, but in a structured way. But when I reran it, I could see that there was a, there, these 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 uh, cases, the, the the bandwidth of uh, decisions wasn't was was by no means as, as as large as it is as it was four years ago. So data, this this quite relevant um, data that that that, uh, uh, that is published in an unstructured way, namely as texts, um, can be used. Journalists use it, and you can develop in very interesting stories. Why not? My question is: Why not? Why shouldn't the, uh, the court um, offer this data, this 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 data, in a structured way, so that the whole process can actually be sped up, and we can report? Journalists can report um, in, a, in, a, in a in a in a more timely fashion um, on, on 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 aspects like this. Now that exactly that has happened. Um, we have today, um, and especially during the Corona virus, we have data sets that are structured and that does allow us to, to outsource the boring stuff um, to the code that I went into in detail before and focus on the relevant story. And, and I really believe, um, I put a little exclamation mark here. I think it's, I really think it's the, your job as civil servants to to, to enable this. Um, I won't go in these, uh, but what I want to look at is this story here now, um, how we developed this, uh, this story that we update every day. Um, how are the figures, the coronavirus new, uh, figures, vaccinations, new in infections, deaths, um, hospitalizations, um, how are they developing? Um, this story has, um, has been a, also a commercial success that just proves how the interest we have um, in total uh, sold over 7,000 subscriptions. We can track that uh, down. These 7,000 subscriptions we can track down to, the, to, to, to uh, people use, reading this story. Um, now, what led the way for, for us to be able to do this? Right, very From very early on, the Johns Hopkins University, um, they um, started collecting data on the coronavirus from all over the world in a structured manner. Um, but it wasn't this map that really made the, 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 uh, uh, that we profited from. It's interesting, I think a lot of readers use it. It was, it was what we have here. Uh, Maria, she said, we'll be sharing the slides with you. Um, a, lot of these, a lot of the slides, that I, a lot of the images I have here are clickable, so you can click on here and you can go and find out. Um, a little bit more about the sources or the stories that I'm sharing, if you want to. Now, what we have here is we're back in the, the, the so-called GitHub repository. This is where um, Johns Hopkins University, every day, um, you'll see this is in maybe a little bit more common, these folders. They gather and collect data and share it here in, in, in so-called comma-separated value files, which are basically... Um, most of you, I'm sure, will know what that what they are, but they're basically Excel files, and they're shared in a way that so that a computer can access these files um, without a human having to download them, open them up, and sort through it, and then copy paste the information. So, whilst we can outsource that to the machine and do all that um, to develop stories like this, like a map of Europe with the incidences of. Um, uh, coronavirus in various smaller regions of uh, European regions, or we can show um, which countries are buying the percent, which percentage of doses uh, of, of the vaccine from which company, and so on. Or also this and uh, this interactive story that I mentioned before um, uh, was is, is is fully auto automatic actually and allows us uh, because the data is so consistent in the way that these that these third parties developing it. Um, that we can just rely on that now 
without having to, without having to, the human actually having to do any any more work on it. Now, so we have these, uh, we, we we have these CSV files on the left hand side. You'll see um, the list since uh, this is now the beginning of the year. The, the, the comma separated values, Excel sheets, basically that Johns Hopkins publishes every single day. Um, we have our in the middle. This is our R script that handles this this data brings it into a an, into a structure so that we can then pop it into our visualization tool um, and, it, and and uh, and and display the data in a way that every so that everybody can understand it. So you see, this is a quite a, a recent um, um, visualization of the incidences of the coronavirus, whatever you have. The Swiss, the Swiss government at the beginning, I think many governments um, all over Europe were offering this information in PDFs. You can write computer scripts to get the information out of uh, uh, PDFs, but again, that takes time. Um, it's, and the structure of the PDF might change. It's nothing you want to be doing all the time um, for a very relevant story when it regards uh, these court cases on migrants, data that has never been made machine readable before. It might make sense. But if you're working on a daily story on a daily basis, this is not the way it should work. But the Swiss it has really come on. The, the, the canton of Switzerland um, at, at first had a very similar way of uh, gathering and displaying the figures um, um, as basically modelled on what the Johns Hopkins University was doing. They collected not just for the canton of Zurich, but for all Swiss cantons. They started gathering the data and publishing it uh, uh, in a structured manner so that we can work with it. But in the meantime, the Swift House Ministry has, has, has does, does exactly that. Um, they have at the end of their of, of their dashboard um, that this also has a few small visualizations. They offer the whole data as a CSV or a JSON, another even more for machines, even better uh, format to process data. Uh, they offer a downloads every day of the, every uh, of the entire uh, data collection that they can offer. So we really have come on quite far in these in the last twelve months. Um, here's a, just a, a brief uh, um, uh, list of the most important sources we use for this thing. Um, now, just. Pardon me, sorry, just to uh, remind you of the time that uh, we will be entering the Q&A uh, session in like 10 minutes or so. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Thanks, Miriam. I will, I will move on. Um, a brief note on big tech. Um, they obviously masters of gathering data, but they are also masters of sharing data. Obviously, very, they're very picky about what they share, but the way they do it, is in in and, and I want to be talking a little bit about that uh, later on in in REST APIs. REST APIs are basically use the same protocol as what we're used to when we when we're surfing the web, and they use that to share their vast amounts, their vast troves of data. I will talk. I want to talk to you about this. And REST APIs really are the best way of sharing large data sets. Um, this story I did here was working with uh, um, every single tweet that Trump had tweeted. You can imagine that's a lot of data. Every single reaction people have had with that tweet, um, which is even more, where that goes into the millions, maybe even billions. Um, and you can access this using the Twitter API, which is REST. It's a REST API. So it uses the same protocols as um, our as, we, as, as the normal, uh, as when we serve in the web. And just um, what I did here was to just to work uh, to get the figures of how many times did he actually attack within a certain time frame. Of course, um, who, who were the ones he attacked most? Yeah, it's obviously it's Barack Obama. No surprise. How did and using the because we also have the text um, using a simple sentiment classifier is does this does this uh, text contain um, aggressive language, um, negative framing? Um, a simple um, um, sentiment classifier just, just to see how this this tone of his uh, uh, of his tweets developed. And again, you can see um, during his presidency, it, it, it increased quite a lot. Um, I shall move on here. 
Now, this is a very important story. Um, I have another six minutes left, I see. Um, what we were really interested in um, at the NZZ was to understand um, what, how differently the various regions of Switzerland um, at various points during the pandemic were, were uh, affected uh, by the virus. Um, but the, uh, the Swiss um, health ministry did not want to share data so granularly because they said this is data, this is pri there's privacy sensitive, there's, we cannot share data on, on this small level. Um, there were very small municipalities in Switzerland in that case, and if there's only two or three infections, you may know who that was. Um, so what we did, we came up with a different way of dealing with this privacy issue. We, we developed, we, get, we asked for them to give us a dummy set, a dummy data set, which they did. Um, and with that, we developed a, a, a code um, that all it did was uh, uh, um, um, section the result into five different buckets. Here it was, here, this was actually six, but here into five different buckets, into six buckets, to show the, the, which areas were the ones the most um, uh, affected more by the virus than others. We then gave the script to the Swiss health, the Swiss health industry, and they could, they then ran the script with the figures and gave us the results back. Basically, they gave us back the maps. So we could really show that in the first wave, it was the, it was which, which of the, it was the French Swiss and the Italian Swiss, which were the ones that are most affected. Um, over here, it was the Italian Swiss um, were much less affected by the second wave. Um, and probably due down to the due to the restrictions, much much tighter restrictions that they had um, than compared to the first wave. So a very novel way of dealing with this privacy issue. And it's something that I account to time and time, time and time, time and time again when we're dealing with administrations that they um, they, they 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 are hesit hesitant, very often hesitant to share data because they are afraid of um, they have privacy concerns. Now, this model could be, not just for Corona, for many other things, could be a workaround. Something I, I, would really, I really think administrations and civil servants should consider. Um, again, here, if anybody's interested in, 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 in more of how we, in more details of how we did this, I have linked um, the description, which is, um, which is also in English, um, on our, uh, here in the presentation. So give it a, yeah, have a look at it if you're interested. Um, final point, we are obviously very, very dependent on um, data, data, the structure of data not changing once we start working with the data set. In this case, the vaccinations, uh, the speed with the vaccinations uh, campaigns are moving in various different countries. Once that, if that, if that, um, if that structure changes, um, we have to rewrite our code, and if we're not informed in a timely fashion, then then there will be a phase where this product that we have developed won't work for our readers. And I really think we need to work the journalist community and administrations. They need to work out some way of communicating with each other better to highlight this. In Germany, you have the case the, the Robert Koch Institute are constantly changing their the data set, the way the data is structured, um, meaning that sometimes dozens of maps that various newspapers have, have developed just don't work for several hours until the, 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 the data journalists who are then frantically working on to fix this, uh, that manage to fix them. The same goes, again, it's not just a corona-related problem here. This is, a, this is something totally automated um, uh, product that we developed uh, showing the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the parties in in Germany, we have the Bundestagswahl in Germany coming up, um, showing how uh, the, the polls have developed or are developing. And again, if that if anything changes in the structure um, there, um, this is a company we, we actually buy. Uh, we um, we have have a pay a small fee for this data, um, so we have a there's a there's a, there is a uh, um, we would be informed here, yeah, but I think it needs to be um, it, there, there there needs to be some kind of uh, more communication also when it comes to open data on the governmental level. So I have two more minutes um, and 
I'm not wanting to race you through, but here is just a brief overview of all the new um, and developing skills that you find in newsrooms. And a lot of it is it revolves around data literacy, how, where to find data, what scraping means, what APIs are, um, what, what, what cleaning data involves, um, what clustering is. These are all terms and terminologies that, that, that are becoming much more common in newsrooms. Um, and I really think this, these terms should be also uh, more common and more broadly used on, the, on, on your side as well. Um, an overview of the resources, um, the development. You have a whole list of open data platforms on your uh, portal. Um, they're happening. And, and but just as important are the open source software tools that are available, um, especially the R, the Python communities, the tools that developers within these communities are really, really uh, very uh, solid and, 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 and being moved and developed on in a large speed. Now, before I'm, I have, I have, just give me one more minute, Maria, and then we will open up to questions. Please, please, Barnaby, take your time because we are reaching the more, you know, interesting part. So please take your time to explain the points. Okay, I hope I hope everything else was interesting, but. Uh, um, the, I mean, the more actionable for okay, us. No, I, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm sorry. Uh, the uh, I have eight um, eight requirements to, to to data to the data sharing of governmental um, administrations. Now, um, it, there needs to be on data portals. There needs to be a, a uniform data format and structure. Something that I see um, in most um, products nowadays especially in your data, uh, in your EU data portal, that is everywhere you have a very, um, a, quite a diverse um, um, offering of data formats, ranging from CSVs, JSONs, but also then more complex data when it comes to the geographical data, which has several levels. Um, what is done, is not done all the time in the depth that would be necessary is the elaborate documentation of this data, where does it come from? Who, who collected it? When is it collected? What's missing? And so on. N, and something that does, really does not happen enough on a governmental level is why not create these REST APIs? As I said, REST APIs are the simplest way of giving access to large data sets because they rely on um, available uh, current HTTP protocols. Um, if you, there, were, oh, there were lots of other ways. You use Sparkle, um, which is also an interesting way of sharing data and having, doing, having, um, giving people the opportunity to make data requests in an automated fashion. But why not just use a REST API? Why use a different? Um, I think most of the data journalists that I know, you work with, like working with REST APIs the most because they're very familiar with the HTTP protocol. We need these uh, these uh, offerings need to make, make historized queries possible. So they need to know when um, you need to, if there's something changed, if, if data actually does change, and there were mistakes in the past. That's also something that needs to be made available, um, then or, or stay available. Um, infrastructure work to work with privacy sensitive data. That was the example I gave you before um, regarding the Swiss cantons. I think you, sh if possible some kind of support, ideally 24 hour support, depending on how big the data collection is you are and where you're based, but there needs to be some kind of support, uh, uh, some human involved. Um, um, and very importantly, there needs to be a schedule um, on, on, uh, on any updates that will be made, especially when it comes to the data structure. Um, because that can really mean that a lot of uh, uh, developments that were based on this data, um, a lot of applications just won't work anymore. They just, they'll just fail. Um, ideally, give everybody a publicly available roadmap of what data sets will become added, um, maybe even why certain data sets weren't added. Um, uh, yeah. So they're, they're my four main points. Um, when it comes to data portals, open government data portals. Um, 
Sparkle. I just had a, I had a, a quick look at. There are, of course, I'm a, I I work with Python. There's a there's a Sparkle library um, that gives me the opportunity to to work quite very easily with what you offer. But why not just work with a, a REST API? So, I only five minutes overdrawn. I was a little scared of halfway through if I was going to get through, but. I hope, hopefully, um, that was concise enough for you. I've tried to cram in a lot as much as possible. Um, thank you for your attention. And any any questions, I'm I'm happy to happy to take. Um, thank you very much, uh, Barnaby. Uh, I think we already have a question here uh, from uh, Edgar, and uh, he's thanking for the uh, presentation and. Um, uh, um, just a moment. He wants to know more about the REST uh, APIs um, as many uh, services are uh, moving to cloud-based data storage. It comes with uh, variable ho uh, hosting costs for transferring data out. Uh, um, uh, sorry, because it keeps moving. Cost for transferring data out of the cloud. How can one prevent abuse of a functionality such as REST API? For example, if someone links up and downloads terabytes worth of data, it can lead to very significant costs. Very good point. And that is precisely that is also another reason why the big tech companies use REST APIs, because you can get people, you, you can restrict people, um, restrict the number of requests people can make. Um, you can you you will need. I mean, there are a lot of very very open REST APIs. But for instance, the Twitter API, you need to subscribe to. You get a login, and that you can all pack that into into your request so that Twitter knows who's downloading how much information. And that's also very important. That's the that's the relationship you will need. You need to uh, then create with the various newsrooms. So you will give them a login, um, and you'll know oh, the entity has been downloading much too much. Um, we'll have to start charging them if they carry on down, uh, downloading data in that quantity. That's also, for, for Twitter, it's also a business case. I think a lot of, at a certain point, they start charging people for, for, for companies, social media monitoring companies for, for, their, for their data requests. So yes, you can use, you can, you can uh, give people credentials to log in using uh, the REST APIs. Thank you. Um, another question that uh, popped into my mind while I was uh, listening to you. Um, in the journalists developing skill set that you presented, uh, you showed us a multidisciplinary landscape. One would argue that those skill set, skill sets needs to be need to be mirrored in the communication teams of public administrations. Would you agree with that? And uh, to take it one step further, uh, do you think that um, the open data portals be handed over to communication teams instead of uh, IT or, or knowledge management teams? I don't know. Well, I think, of course, it makes sense for, for there to be at least some data literacy or an increased level of data, data literacy in communication departments. I really think that makes sense. The, the, the dealings that we have had with the communication department, or a lot of data journalists in Switzerland have had with the communication departments and department during the, the ep ep epidemic, has been very sluggish, precisely because the, there was no there was nobody within the department who could really answer any of the questions. That all was had to be relayed over to to uh, uh, to the to the specialists, um, and then relayed back, and then translate. It was a very a very weary process, um, and. The, we actually did have very recently. We had a conversation with the Swiss Ministry, the, the, the Communications Department, and they are now um, they have given, they are now giving us um, people in the IT team that they are bringing into the Communications Department who we can address our questions through directly. So yes, I think it does make sense for communication departments to build up more data, data literacy skills just for the conversation that they're having with the journalists. And the second point, of course, the whole having a whole infrastructure then in incorporated into that doesn't make sense. But 
again, I think um, I think there needs to be, especially the the, the people that uh, the, the, the 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 support service I mentioned, they need to be somehow involved with the communication department for there to be a, a healthy uh, communication with all these various requests journalists are having regarding the the data portal. So again, I think there just needs to be yes, the IT the people providing the data portals need to be in much more clo closer contact with the communications department. Uh, thank you. Um, which kind of profiles of people uh, sit in your team for a big data story? Um, there are basically two different types. You have the journalists um, who, who have started off their career as a journalist and who have then um, that I myself are one of them, have taught themselves or have been taught to, to program um, because they have been working with larger and larger data sets and they reach a point where they can't handle this and it's the data that they're telling stories with in a spreadsheet. So then they move on to program, programming to a programming language which can do it. Um, um, there are more and more uh, courses in kind of in the basic journalism curriculums for data journalism. Um, so the Zurich University, for instance, offers offers a course um, in Germany. I see a lot of them popping up. Um, there's a growing community of, of conferences. Um, the Data Harvest out of Mechelen, for instance, that happens every year has a growing community of, of data dedicated journalists. Um, and then you also have the people from um, data science. We have a member of our team who was actually working for the university in a in a um, in the economic in a economic research unit from Zurich University. He has joined our uh, team now, who and he has he had he obviously um, lacks certain journalistic skills, but brings on brings a lot of data um, analytics skills to the table and um, we're kind of yeah it's working working uh, surprisingly well and i see that more and more people joining newsrooms that are not traditionally from a from a, a don't have a journalistic background but more uh, a statistical background um yeah so they're basically they're the two profiles that you find in using in our newsroom and in many other newsrooms as well Thank you. Um, in your presentation, you highlighted the importance of an upstream stage of database, data access, data management. Um, okay, uh, we've established the, the, the need for people in public administrations to improve their data literacy skills is undisputed. But the question is, how can more people in public administrations improve their data literacy skills? Um, uh, do you have any suggestions based on the parallel journey, let's say, of journalists, because they too um, uh, were faced with uh, this need to, um, uh, you know, step up their game uh, as regards uh, data and data visualization? Um, it's a very good point and a very good question. Um, I, um, in my point of view, from my point of view, I don't. I see a lot of, I see a lot of uh, um, education being done in the field of data journalism, but I see very, very little education in the field of, of the communication departments. And or in, I mean, I'm 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 looking mainly now in Switzerland and Germany, but I see very, very few um, organisations that are training communications experts. Um, on data literacy, so I think I, I really think there's a there's a there's a big there's a lot of catch up to be done here. Um, I can't I can't name you one that's doing this. And um, um, maybe a last question: Given the the environment and the restrictions under which public administrations operate, uh, which recommendations of your eight points would you prioritize? Because uh, uh, not everything can be, um, you know, achieved in uh, uh, overnight. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think the most, uh, I think a, re- a, a more a, a consistent um, adaption of REST APIs would be my, if I could choose, if I could choose something, that would be it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Barnaby, for your out of the bubble tips, and uh, thank you all for attending and actively participating with questions. We hope you enjoyed this session and look forward to seeing you in our next webinar on 18th uh, June, where um, Rob Fry, head of data visualization at the Office for National Statistics in the UK, will guide us through the journey of the office to becoming an online first organization. Uh, before we close, uh, let me share with you some exciting news about the first ever Open Data Days, the free online event that the Publications Office organizes from 23rd to 25 November to bring to the EU public sector innovative solutions on open data and open visualization. Um, well, the application period for proposals closed recently at a total of 247 submissions from 47 countries around the world. And I can tell you they are very good and interesting proposals indeed. They are now under review and soon to be shortlisted and announced. So stay tuned.